we're good to go. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Farzad Youssef Sadeh. I am originally coming from Iran, but have been living in Finland for two years now. I've come here from Finland all over. It was minus two and raining. It was a shitty weather, but <laughs> we survived. Um, so. Before I start, we might be into a tight schedule today because I have a lot of slides and there are like a lot of codes here. It might be overwhelming, you might get freaked out, so it's totally normal because this is a concept that I was freaked out when I was being introduced to. Just bear with me, we'll get super practical, something that you can relate to and just use next Monday at your work. Um, so a bit of introduction, as people said, uh, my Currently, state is I work as a senior software engineer in a company called Futurize, which is a web consultancy based in Helsinki, but we have different branches in other cities of the Europe too. I work and live in Finland. My previous state was I used to study aerospace engineering, and I was an astrophysicist observing the night, night sky and all the nerdy stuff uh, back in college. But I have a pretty interesting story. I dropped out of college at the last semester because I figured out this is not how I'm going to end up with in my career, and this is not how I'm going to live my life. So I got out, I started to teach myself as a self-taught developer. I learned from the web, and here I am now after almost seven years giving back to the web. Um, you can follow my activities. I'm usually on Twitter more than my own job, so um, make sure to follow me on Twitter if you want me uh, hear me rambling about anything. Uh, about JavaScript. I also am uh, kind of active on GitHub too, but they're like two different usernames. Yeah, so I want to tell you today that people have different definitions of complexity. Um, well, kind of spoiler alert, I'm talking about complexity today. Some people think complexity comes with the styling, having to support many responsive layouts on the web, having to support many platforms, and of course, IE, and um, Safari Mobile, and they're like um, foldable phones coming. I'm, I'm yet trying to get ready for the foldable media query in CSS to support them. Other people think cross-browser compatibility makes the client-side development really complex and brings added complexity. I don't blame them. We have a lot of browsers to support. We have a lot of platforms we have to support. And most of the times, as client developers, we have to develop for more than one platform. Uh, Cross-platform cross -platform sharing, uh, if, you, if you get to like share your components between two different platforms, or if you want to uh, load your website in more than one browser, literally, you're dealing with cross-platform sharing, and that means it's added complexity. You, you, I, I literally had to support IE8, and I know someone who's been dealing with IE6 for developing a search based just last week at work. Uh, and some other people think business logic adds complexity. They're right also. Everyone who thinks differently here is right. Complexity is everywhere, especially in client development. Some other people think accessibility and usability is complex. And U9Y is actually something I came up with. <laughs> it's not common. Other people also think there are a lot of external actors uh, affecting what we do directly and indirectly in terms of client development. Things like network requests, things like security threats, things like, um, like a, a lot of preferences that a user has. If the user has like the dark mode as a preference, then you have to like take that into account, this sort of stuff. But specifically talking about having many things into account, it adds up to the branching of the logic in something you're developing. And when you have branching, you will end up with a high cyclomatic complexity. Cyclomatic complexity is a term used in computer science that um, tries to indicate um, how much complex a certain code base solution or software is. It can be statically analyzed, by the way. There are like tools that do that for you. They're literally a VS Code extension that does that for all the functions you write in React and JavaScript. But when projects grow, the parameters that you have to support for that project, or even a React single React component, grow linearly. Project managers and product owners come literally to you every day saying that we yet need to support one other thing. I know that it's a small, it will take one hour. It's just an if. You've heard of that, you've heard that a lot, right? But the parameters that you need to support, they usually grow linearly, but cyclomatic complexity grows exponentially. Because when you have 
two parameters that can somehow live together, you won't end up with two things to support as complexity. You will end up with at least four. But having a complex problem is not a is not problem itself per se. The problem is complexity will usually lead to confusion. And confusion is the part that we all get freaked out. We get out of our comfort zone. We don't know what we're doing. We have no clue. Sometimes we just have to like take some time off and then come back to it in order to learn something. You have been onboarded to the legacy code, right? You can relate to that. You're added to a large scale project, a project that has been marketed at large scale, like Facebook social network. And then you get to deal with like a PHP code base that is as old as you. And it's, it's confusing because there are a lot of things in the business requirements you need to know, and there are like a lot of barriers you need to carry. Confusion also leads to unpredictable behavior. The software you develop, the solution you offer as an expert, if you are confused, then it means that you're most probably is missing some, are missing something. And if you're missing something, the thing you're developing or the solution you're offering is usually unpredictable. Because you don't know what you're doing, of course your solution doesn't work the way it's intended. On the other hand, complexity also plays well with the factor of time. When it takes some time, complexity grows. We all know legacy code. Everything is starts green. When you write from scratch, you're happy. You, can, you have full control. You go into like, configuring many things. You're happy. For me, two hours after that, I'm sad. My threshold is two hours. For me, the code I didn't write is complex and is legacy. The code I wrote more than two hours ago is legacy. People have different thresholds. True story. And not everyone has this chance to work on the perfect evergreen project. It's marketed as legacy code. We all hate it. But the truth is, it pays your rent. Once a wise person said, writing the software is easy. Of course. The maintaining is hard. When you want to maintain, it's where you trigger the pain in the sweet spot. But let's take a step, a step back. Let's talk about behavior again. I mentioned behavior once. What is behavior really? If you want to talk about behavior, we need to have a definition for it. I try to define behavior as the way that the software I'm writing is supposed to work. But I have a problem. Whenever I try to communicate the behavior of something I'm building with other people, I had problem. When I'm working in a product team, I'm a developer for the client side on the browser. There is an Android developer, there is an iOS developer, there is a designer, and there's a product owner. And we all want to talk about something, one thing, but we can't talk to each other. What was the last time a JavaScript developer talked about the carousel component with a Java developer? Didn't happen, right? You rarely see that. Sometimes we're always blocked by other people. For example, designers, most, most likely, they figure out how a UI is going to be developed and implemented based on a certain requirement that have been passed over to them from the business team. And then you just you are blocked by them, and then you just take it and implement it. I know that it's not delicious, it's not tasty, but it's real. At least I developed in 2019 like that. But if we found a way that we could communicate behavior of the components we write to each other without having to go into the implementation detail. That would be awesome, right? I could tell you, hey, I'm developing something. It's supposed to behave like this. I don't know what, what tech I'm going to choose. React, Vue, whatever. I, I even go and like develop it with Reason React or Native or whatever. But it is supposed to work like this. Which leads us to the fact that we can talk about something practical. Let's say that we have a search box that is supposed to um, like query for emails from a server, and the user is supposed to write in it. Let's talk about the behavior. Let's try to be abstract. We want the user to be able to write into this input. We also want the search input to validate what user is writing in it. The search input is also supposed to query for suggestions or similar emails or whatever when the user is typing. It's a good UX. It's called type ahead. Also, the querying should happen when the user has stopped typing. You, shouldn't, you, you don't probably want to like do DDoS on your own server. 
when the user is typing just like literally <laughs> like request for the suggestions of the emails and like it's it's not going to happen you need to debounce or throttle based on your use case and when there is no email available the user should see a sad panda picture when there is some error in querying anything can go wrong in terms of network requests right show a red text describing what went wrong user need to see the suggestion has failed the fact that I just literally talked about the behavior of a simple search box with you, it means that behavior can be abstract. It means that we can talk about behavior in an abstract way, in an abstract language without, I can be a React expert, you can be a Vue expert, some other people can be a native mobile expert, and we yet can talk to each other about a single damn component. But part of behavior is abstract. Not everything can be abstracted as a core behavior. Some things are living in the implementation layer. Things like browser quirks or limitations that the platform doesn't allow you based on them to deliver a certain spec. Sometimes things can't happen just because the platform is limited. So part of the behavior can be abstracted as the core and can be communicated. Which means we can find an abstract language to describe this behavior and help go farther and define it and let the component work based on that without get, getting into the implementation detail and how we want to implement it. Enough said. Today, I'm going to talk about finite state machines and an, an extended concept of them called state charts. Well, um, I'm not coming from a CS background. So as a normal person does, I went to Wikipedia and searched finite state machines. Can you realize what happened? It said it's a quintuple. What the fuck? <laughs> What's a quintuple? <laughs> I don't know. It probably is some core mathematical concept. I don't know. But I know now, but I didn't know more than a year ago when I was starting with this concept. Since finite state machines are a mathematical concept, they're a way to model something. They are a, 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 a way for you to be able to simulate a, a, like a natural I don't know, phenomena or whatever. And finite state machines are coming from the computation world. If you have like, gone through the bachelors of computer science or software engineering, you have most probably heard of them. I know you don't understand them like me. Uh, but there's also state charts. Uh, the state charts came out of the state machines when David Harrell was working with the Israeli avionics to develop the user interface for the aircrafts. And they soon realized that final state machines cannot be used fully and totally to be able to um, develop a live real world user interface. Because if you made a mistake and you introduce a bug, the pilot was gone. So let's take better and more practical approach to talk about finite state machines. A finite state machines, as said in the name, can be, can, can be um, percepted as, as a pure function that accepts a finite amount of states for you, something like locked and unlocked in a simple switch. It can have a finite set of states, and it always starts from an initial state, because things don't just come out of blue. They need to start from somewhere. And they also let you send different sort of events in order to execute a change. A software is a living software. It needs to change and transition between a state A and B. When you open the switch, the state needs to go from unlocked to, locked to unlocked, and the way around. And a finite state machine takes a state event approach. It means that normally, if, if you have used Redux, for example, in the React world, you've been doing event state approach. You've been developed in an event-driven environment with modeling everything globally. If you have used Redux, you know that actions and events can live independently in the global context at the same time. So it means if the user is logged out, I still can say, go and log it out. But in a state machine, since you tight couple the states and the events, you take state into the consideration, it, it acts like a firewall and rejects whatever that is invalid. So instead of guarding against whether the user is logged out to be able to, to actually log it out, a state machine doesn't even allow it in the first place. We'll get really practical, bear with me. But what is a state chart? 
Well, in order to be able to simulate a real-world UI, you can't just use state machines because state machines are limited. They require a finite amount of states, and not everything can be modeled with a finite amount of states. And not everything are flattened as described in FSM. Sometimes things happen after some other things has happened before. For example, you want the user to be able to check out in an e-commerce application only when the cart is full, only when they added something to the cart. Or a form can only be submitted after the input is validated. Things happen in a hierarchy in the real world. So that, that's why state charts add some stuff to the state machine to be able to model this. They add nested machines. They can, they can nest the states into each other. They give it life cycle. Some other times, states can live parallel to each other. They can live in the same context of one parent, but they're independently living together. Things like a download and an upload manager in a single file manager. You don't want user to be blocked by downloading when, when the user is uploading already. It doesn't make any sense. Or like a Twitter fit and a side widget that is trying to deal with the world trends and hashtags and whatever. They live in the same context of a Twitter application, but they are independently living from each other. And most likely, they don't affect to each other. They also add a way for you to be able to conditionally transition. I know that these stuff sound boring. I'll literally get practical in two slides. Please tolerate me. Uh, they add conditional transitions. Because in, in, in a pure finite state machine world, if you want to do something based on an if and else, you yet have to define another state to be able to branch. But it's not practical. What if I have like many transitions that should happen conditionally? Then I'll end up with a final state machine that is already exploded with like more than hundreds of states. How can I learn from that? I, I, I was better off with my imperative world. And they also give you the way to store non-concrete state. As I said, not everything can be modeled in a finite way. Things like animation, or things like a volume slider in the YouTube player. How could you be able to model that with a finite amount of state? You, you can like define 100 state from 1 to 100, but that's not practical. That's not pretty. That's why they give you a context of non-concrete state, or extended state, or context, which is basically some primitive data. They also give you a way to store data, things like response coming from server or the error, things you want to persist and reason based on them. They also support entry actions, which is good for initializing things. And they also support the notion of exit actions, which are good for cleaning up. If you have used use effect hook in React, you know that you can pass a callback. You can return a callback from the use effect, and it will run it as a means of cleaning up when it's trying to re-execute. A lot of more. There are just a lot more to this. We don't have time for that today. But one thing that is super important is that when you deal with finite state machines and state charts, you need to think in the states. You all remember when we moved from other worlds like jQuery to React, we had to shift our mindset from thinking imperatively on how to do things to what we should do declaratively or to think about components rather than a bunch of living HTML a uh, markup that can interact to each other. The same shift of mindset should happen here, too. You tend to think about the state differently. This is what we're accustomed to in terms of a state. We can have these loading counts, errors. They're just different entities put into one state object. But in the, in the state machine world, a state is a bit more abstract and explicit. It's not about the data you hold. It's about what state you're in. So your state can go into idle loading success and error. This is coming from the remote data article, which is very famous for people who want to use discriminated unit and type of scripts to model that. So state is different. And in terms of React development, in terms of when you're dealing with a React component and you want to develop that and you want to leverage the state machines, React component is here still. But instead of dealing with your own choice of state management, it like, it, it still deals with that, because state, state machines are pluggable, and they can work with literally everything. So it tells you, like, for example, your Redux code base, that I want this change, or I want, I want this action to be dispatched. And Redux leverages state machine to compute something as an isolated uh, pure function. Then it calculates, tells it what the state is, and it gets it back.
But time to get more practical, I promise you. Before we get practical, a couple of notes. Uh, for the notion of state machines definitions here, I'll use a library called XState, which is quite popular these days and trendy in JavaScript community because this is kind of the most popular implementation of SCXML standard for JavaScript, written by David Korshit. You, you might probably have heard of him before. And we will use a JSON format to define this behavior because why not? JSON is serializable. Almost every language can encode into JSON and decode from JSON. So they give you the portability. You can literally port the behavior into different platforms. And there's no surprise, everybody already knows JSON. And we can use state machines not just for components, but for app level states as well, for integrating different parts of your application. But that's a different scope. We're not going into that today. We'll just uh, consider isolated complexity, one component that gets complicated. Example one. Let's go through a couple of examples. Before that, excuse me. OK, let's think about the debouncing input. Let's, about, let's, let's write a React component that is a simple input, but needs to be debounced in terms of running an unchanged handler. So we want the component to have this API. We want the component to be named debounce input, input and have an unchange. You can pass whatever you want to it, and it can have a delay. You can tell it to debounce it for this amount of time. All good? Let's dive in. This is how we write in React. If you're using hooks, I'm going to get out of screen so you can see it better. So if you were using hooks, for example, in Redux, you probably would have defined an unchanged handler. You could use one user state to persist the value of the input. And this is dumb, I know, but I'm proving a point here. Another user state for the loading. And you can say in the use effect to run this side effect that set the loading to true, try search, Catch finally and then set loading to false. And whenever the value changes, you re-execute the effect. And how you want to show the spinner for when the input is running an asynchronous task or searching, you can just assert on the loading. Let's go. Let's see how this would work with the state machines. If you want to rewrite that in the state machines, you would have done it differently. This is how you would do React. So Kind of unchanged, at least, is it's kind of the same, similar. But you would notice that you wouldn't have any internal states in terms of using hooks. You would have a weird function called send event. You would need to send events to the machine. And also, you could use a hook from the XSAID React package called use machine. You will develop a machine. You will start it with that delay you co that comes from the props which will go into the machine because we want the debouncing to happen in the machine level, not in the component level. And then basically, you, when the uh, state matches search, you show the loading. One difference is that we don't have loading anymore. And another difference is that we don't have internal hooks to manage the state. We just send an event. We don't persist anything ourselves. We don't care. And this is the implementation for the state machine. So a state machine, as I said, can be defined as a JSON object. And um, it starts from a waiting state. It has different states. And when it's on the waiting, it waits for you to, to tell it what the value is. And it goes to the debouncing. Whenever it goes into the debouncing, it, it tries to run an update value, uh, which is a function. You update the value from where, where this, this gives you the value from the React, and then you debounce. And if you, if you have noticed, I'm, I'm not saying how to update the value. I'm just saying it's a string called update value. And also, the debounce that comes there, I'm telling it to run this after the debounce time. It's just a notion to do something after a certain amount of time. So um, you, 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 you're not telling it how, what's the time. You're just telling it it's a debounce. And also, it's called the delayed transitions and your state machines is truly a function of the state you gave it. And as I said, send events and to search. There's no loading. And one surprise is that right now, if you want to communicate how this input works, you can just show this to your designer or your CEO. Hey, this is what I developed yesterday. You can show it in the daily. 
because the state machines are directed graphs. So with a bit of graph theory developed by smarter people than me, they can be visualized. You can tell it that it's in waiting, and whenever it receives value, it goes to debouncing. And if the value is, uh, and after debouncing, it gets to waiting again. Otherwise, it goes to search. So it gets updated, and it runs a search after a delay. No surprise, simple debounce. Another example, cancellation. What if we wanted the input to cancel the previous asynchronous search request in order to avoid race conditions? Well, if you wanted to do just pure React, you would have probably instantiated a, an abort controller. And then you would tell search that this is a signal from that controller. And in the, in the, in the cleanup, you could say abort it, because this is where the value updates, so you want to cancel the previous search. But in a state machines, you would do it a bit differently. You would use a notion called invoke promises, which basically is a promise service. You just invoke it there with the invoke keyword. You tell it, whenever you went to the search state, run this service for me. So whenever the input goes into the search state, it invokes a promise. And it initializes a controller and the entry. So a state chart gives you the entry for initializing as a set. And you can just initialize a controller there and save it into the context so that later on, when you're exiting the search, going to waiting again to update the value, you can just abort it and uh, set the controller in the context so undefined. Well, you, you wouldn't have to do that because you can just literally do it here, but it's not good for serializing it later. So you're better off just defining them declaratively, and I can show you how you can define them later on, like what's the implementation for them. Notice what happened to the view here. When we wanted to add cancellation, we didn't change the React view. The React is still working the same way. I didn't touch the React component. I just managed the machine. So I updated, added feature without even touching my React component. Pretty cool, huh? And the cancellation can be visualized like this. Significantly similar to the previous one, but it has an invoke service. OK. But let's talk about mutual exclusivity as the next example. What is mutual exclusivity. It's a concept coming from uh, the world of logic and probability. It means two things that are not supposed to live at the same time. Two properties are mutually exclusive when they cannot happen at the same time. Let's take a look at the form example. Our form can uh, accept an unsubmit handler from us and can also run a callback that we pass to it when it's validating the input. How you would do it is that you could, use, you could use rules reducer and define a state object, tell it that we have is validating, which is a Boolean, and we have is submitting, which is a value. But what happens here is that you're using two Booleans. So you can have is validating false, submitting false, which, is, which means form is idle, you haven't touched it yet. You can have validating false, submitting true, which means form is being submitted. OK, all good. Validating true, submitting false, which means form is being validated. But what the fuck happened here? <laughs> validating true, submitting true. You did a bad modeling with two Booleans, and since they're mutually exclusive, the true things shouldn't happen at the same time. So you introduce an impossible state. And since you don't consider them in your code base, you, prob you most probably are not going to tell user how to recover from that in your app. So this is where you tell the user restart. And the, another problem here is that we are like grouping irrelevant data into one single state object. Evaluating and submitting are, for, are, are form state entities, but error is the data, and touch input is an extended state. OK. Now let's look how we could implement it using final state machines. It's a bit long. I'm sorry for that. I tried my best to embed it here. So how it happens is that it now has a validating and a submitting state. And um, so we, we don't have the bool two Booleans anymore. We can just put them as a states. And we can solve the problem uh, of, of the race condition when, when, the tight couple, when the value event is only tight coupled in the valid state. So it means that you couldn't be able to submit if the input is not valid. And in terms of uh, visualizing it, it looks like this. This is still really easy to grasp how it works when you show it to someone else. Another example. 
Sometimes we underestimate the complexity that comes and grows when the time like moves on. When when you like leave a component B for like two weeks, it grows, and you want to like add new features. When you got back after two weeks, you don't know how, what happened there. You don't know the code base anymore, and the complexity grows. It leads into confusion. Let's see an example. Let's take a carousel example as uh, a carousel component as an example. A carousel looks like this. You can, it can accept two events. You can either go next or previous. And it has different states if you want to model it. It has first state, middle state, and last state. I know that it's different if you wanted to do it with data structure. You would have probably kept a cursor and assert on that with different ifs and branch off for doing stuff. But in the state machines, you need to be able to tell the machine these are concrete states. So you care about the boundaries, and whatever goes in the middle is just one middle state. You don't care about that. So our first attempt would be to start the carousel from the first item. Oh my god, sorry. To start it from the first item, and on first, when you get next, you go to the middle, and you increment the cursor to say that like I'm the second or third or fourth item in the middle state. And the same for middle and last as well. But the difference is that middle not only accepts next, but also accepts prev. So you can just go next and previous. All cool. And you can visualize it like this. It's much easier than the JSON object you saw. You can now really realize how it easily works. There is a middle, there is a first, there is a last, next, prev. Easy peasy. But your pro project manager comes to you, hey, you know what? We want to let the user to be able to start from a custom index. Let's dive into see how we can add that here. We can pass a start index property with saying that the carousel can start from the second item. If you wanted to do that with the, with the old one, this time it's a bit different. You need to say that initial states is actually dependent on what the start index is when you pass it as a property. And the cursor in the context will be uh, the start index that you pass. It's still, the rest of the machine would be the same. But you probably don't want to do that and do a fancy function called get first state or whatever. OK. So when the machine starts from the first index, it looks like this. When you pass two, it starts from middle. And when you pass three, it starts from last. All cool. Another feature request. What if you want the carousel to be cyclic? What if you want it to be to reinvent from back, like from last goes to next and next goes to last? Loop. Then it's a bit more complicated. Then you can say cyclic as a Boolean, and the machine can be modeled like this. The difference here is that now first can also accept priv event. So far, we didn't support priv on the first item because it could only go next. But now, sometimes it can go back only when cyclic is true. You can see a condition. I, I, it's a no, the cond keyword is a notion in a state chart that you can tell it to run this, to, to transition to the last item from first only when is cyclic is true. And your is cyclic can just simply be returning props that cyclic is true. And also from the last, you can now accept next. If it's cyclic, you can go to first. But middle it stays, it stays the same. Cool. Now it visualizes it like this. Two arrows are added based on a condition. Another feature request, what if the carousel had direction? What if it was LTR or RTL? A surprising fact, not everything is left right on web. So what if it was RTL? Things get a bit peculiar and hard here. All right, you could pass a, director, a, a direction here as a property. Now the first state not only can go next when it's LTR, but also it goes prev on the RTL. So it means that the direction property now not only uh, affects the machine, but also affects the transition. If the machine is not cyclic, the first state, uh, state on the LTR should not accept next. It's called combinatorial explosion. It means when you add new properties, the, serv the, serv the, uh, the solution explodes. It means by the rapid growth of the problem, uh, the, the problem will grow, the complexity of your solution will grow when the parameters you need to support grows putting into simple sentences. OK, now what if we want to support that in the machine? You will have to say on the ne next event on the first state can also go to, to last if, the, if it's cyclic and is RTL. 
and the action will be the same. And also on, on, on the priv, it can also go to middle if it's RTL. Now the uh, targets and the conditions are a bit different because you have RTL direction. And machine looks, looks like this. Just imagine you wanted to implement it imperatively without finding the state machines. You would have had tons of if and else. Another feature request is autoplay. What if you wanted to autoplay? Well, guess what? It's quite easy. That's it. You can just tell the machine, so instead of waiting for the next, just autoplay after a certain amount of time. This is where, when you model right, feature adding gets easy. You just tell the machine to go next. It's as easy as that. If you had tons of if and else, you couldn't just do that. You know that. <laughs> and we didn't have to deal with cleaning up because machine does that for you when you exit this state. OK, cool. Now the autoplay is here. Nice. Another feature would be, what if you wanted to pause and resume the machine? OK, it's a bit harder now. All right, that's it. <laughs> if you wanted to pause and resume machine, it means that you will nest the whole states of the machine in a higher level states called pause than playing. So the machine, when it goes to, when you, when you send the event of pause, the machine will stop, go to paused, and only accepts play. So you cannot do next and previous when the machine is paused. You don't need to guard against that with if and else. The machine will take care of it for you. But when it resets, it also resets the playing. When, you, when, when you're in the middle state, you, you pause, you get back, it starts from the start index again. We should solve that. That's where a state chart gives you the ability to define a history state machine. A history state machine is something that can deeply remember where you were. And whenever you get back into it, it just resumes from there. Easy peasy. I had to clip the image in order to embed it here. But this is how crazy it is right now. I just want to say, it might sound as a simple carousel component, but it really isn't. It's super complicated. You just didn't have to deal with it before to see the complexity up front. But what we miss here is that we didn't support animations. A, a carousel is not a good carousel. It just jumps off, goes from like item to item. It should be smooth. So in order to, su in order to support animation, we can also nest one level more, saying that when it's playing, it can either be transitioning, which is when the animation happens, or it can be in the waiting, which is the rest of the machine we already developed. And when it's transitioning, it's just, again, an after uh, block here. After the transition delay you pass as a property, just go back to the history and continue. Super easy. Like, I can't imagine how hard it would be without it. But one side result and side effect, or side benefit, whatever you want to call it, when you, when you, you get when you work with the state machines is that not only it's upfront, and not only you see edge cases when you're defining the behavior, but rather you could just literally share your logic between different platforms. I could just say that my carousel is like this, and I could just define a headless component in React, saying that it's, it's a render props, fancy word for render props. I can just initialize the, with use machine hook, say that I have a carousel machine, initialize the state machine, and just give the children the state data next brief play and pause. Simple stuff. Now I can re reuse it everywhere. Because the way the component renders on different platforms now doesn't really matter because the whole logic is being abstracted as an abstract behavior in your state machine. You can just literally copy paste into React Native and use it here. You can just put it into the web and use it there. No matter what you use for rendering, it still behaves the same. I even did experimental thing and developed a command line application for this. So you can just say on the command line, literally, there is a package called React Inc that supports React rendering on the command line and the terminal. You can just say, when I press the arrow right, send event next. Go next into the carousel. It doesn't matter how you represent, how you use the machine. The machine will behave the same no matter the platforms. But a couple of notes on testing. Estate machines are implementation detail. Please do not test them. It's a sweet spot when the machine can generate all the possible paths that the user can take into using your application. It can tell you how many ways there are from getting from first item to the last item, because you already defined it in the machine in the JSON object. But this is so intriguing, because you will, you will probably go on and test all of them. 
but don't test your machines. Machines are implementation details. The user doesn't care you're using a state machines. The user only cares about the end user experience. So only test input and output interface of what you're developing. Because if you change the underlying implementation, the test shouldn't break. And also, end user usually has a flattened perception of how a software works. You as a developer are like implementing a solution in a way, for example, your user never notices debouncing. It has a flattened perception of how software works. It's not usually aligned with how you implemented that. So you most probably, ideally, want to also have a test state machine for testing it in order to just smartly testing what user sees. So don't test the state machine. Test whatever is using the state machine in a way that is using it. Just a couple of takeaways for you. Use the state machines to model a problem. And let this model be used by your choice of tech. Because a state machine is just a pure function. It can be embedded in Redux, RxJS, CycleJS, MobX, or whatever. It doesn't matter how you save the data or how you transmit data with all those tools. It's still, the computation will happen by a state machine. And use this model as a means of communication. Visualize it, share it with everyone. Everyone will understand what you developed. And also, test it like you don't have the state machine, as I said. State machine is, a, is an implementation detail. And look at this picture that I accidentally took at the Helsinki airport. Do not let the software bully you. You have the control. Tame the complexity, please. You model better. Thank you. <laughs>